Well, uh, that Brenda. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Sure. Yeah? yeah? Good. Right. So, so, so many parallels in Brenda's story and my story. Different circumstances, but some of the things that um, stood out for me was the importance of trust. You needed to trust somebody and you needed to trust the people that were there. And most of the time, the trust wasn't there. You, you spoke about everything has a meaning and that there was a meaning, a grain of meaning in your psychosis. And again, that, that strikes with, with my family situation. Um, such a powerful story, and, and it's just so brilliant to see you here today. It shows how strong you are. One of the things I thought was, was crucial when you, when you said was the tipping point. And it was when Jan realised that what everybody was saying was good for you, what must be the only way forward. He realised that the way the medication was affecting you couldn't continue. When you said, that is not my wife, I don't know her, I don't see her there. And as awful as that was, I think there has to be a tipping point when the family realises we've got to do something, we can't let this continue. And over, over the many years, I've had so many families come to that realisation. This isn't right. This can't be the only way of doing this. And I, I have to say a big thank you for so many families for doing that. Because sometimes when you're in that situation, you don't have the power to do anything. It's difficult for families. They can't always do anything. But what they can do is speak out, try and work together, which is what I try to do with other family members and support each other. But that last photo you showed us was just so heartening and such strength that Jan showed to stay with you and for you to know you could still trust him. So, so important and so difficult for so many family members. And what I found over the years, both in my own experience and in other families, is that trust between the, the family member, the mother, the wife, the, the, the partner, uh, the daughter, can so easily go and it can be so difficult to get that trust back. And if only everybody was working together from the start and there were some real choices, then it would be less likely that that trust would go. I'm going to tell you some of the things that happened with our family, and, and I need to say that I do find it difficult to do this. It's not easy for me at all. Um, one reason it's not easy is because I might get upset, because it is very upsetting, but I'm sure you'll understand that if I get upset. We're talking about difficult things here, yeah? But also, because my son isn't here and it doesn't feel right talking about him. It's very difficult for me to talk about my experiences without talking about his experiences. I'm going to do this, but I feel I need to trust you to keep the things I'm saying about him to your set in here, to learn from those experiences, but it feels like I'm betraying him to talk about him when he's not here and he can't, he's not able to give consent to what I'm saying. So it feels like, a re and, and that's one of the tensions for family members, because it's very difficult for us to talk about our experiences without talking about what happened to our loved ones. And that's something that perhaps in the question time we can talk about. It's not an easy thing to do, but I feel I have to do it in order to explain why, what I struggled with. So, um, when, um, when my son first ended up in a psychiatric unit, I really did feel 
I was doing the best thing. I didn't know what else to do. Um, and I'll describe to you the first time he was in a psychiatric ward. And this is what happened. <coughs> I'd never been on a psychiatric ward before. I didn't know anything about them. Now, you imagine you're going to, to visit someone the first time in a hospital. You take something that they like. You think of their favourite thing and you take it. That's the natural thing to do. So I took a bunch of bananas and a bottle of mango lassi. That's a yoghurt drink, right? His favourite things. Um, and I get there at two o'clock in the afternoon because I'd been advised that was, that was the visiting time, I was told, right? So I get there and we're in this visitor's room, which feels like a very strange, alien place to me, but that's where we were. Um, he, he didn't really look like himself, but I didn't know what to expect. So I gave him the bunch of bananas <laughs> and the big bottle of mango lassi, and he appeared to, well, he just demolished the bananas one after another and drank this whole mango lassi. I said, well, you, you seem pretty hungry. What, what did you have for your lunch? And I got this. I can't go in that dining room, I'm too scared. So I said, well, what did you have for your breakfast? And nothing. So when I got there at two o'clock, I had nothing to eat. And nobody appeared to know. And I thought, well, this, this is a hospital. This feels a bit strange. So I went, I said, I'll just go and see if I can chat with somebody. And that, just to find somebody that knew him, and he hadn't even been in there 24 hours, felt <coughs> odd. And nobody knew he hadn't had anything to eat. And I just thought, oh, I've got to try and get him out of here. This, this can't be right. He can't just not eat. And he loved his food, and he ate what I gave him. So we sort of chatted a bit more. And I went home, we, his dad, we went home with very heavy hearts. He thought, what? what have we done? <coughs> how, how, how did this happen? We've got to find a way out of this. Let's see if we can change our minds. Well, it wasn't our decision anyway, but let's see what we do about it. Anyway, we'd been home about half an hour, and we were thinking, what can we do? We'll phone, this is a Saturday, a weekend. It always is a weekend, isn't it? Oh, we'll phone the doctor on Monday and see if we can find a way of getting him out of there. Uh, and then the phone rang. And it was my son at the bus station. And we said, well, hang on, how, how have you got there? We, we, you were in the hospital. Well, he didn't really explain. He said, I just need to come home. He said, I've, I've decided I want to go camping in the mountains of Morn. Anyone know Van Morrison who talks about mountains of Morn? It was somewhere he'd always want to go. He said, just need to go camping in the mountains of Morn. I know I'll feel better if I do that. If you can just, if I just get some of my stuff together and take me to somewhere where I can get a bus or a boat to the mountains of Morn, and if, gave me ideas of what he wanted for his favourite meal. He said, I'll be okay and I'll get out of your hair. So, I phoned the hospital to tell them that my son is at the bus station and what should we do? That was my first mistake. We should have just got him and got out of there. But you think being good parents and do the right thing. Um, they said, uh, oh, when we've located him, we'll let you know. I just can't see him at the moment. I said, no, he's at the bus station. And they said, we will call you back when we've located him. I put the phone down, and at that moment, I knew we were not dealing with reality. And the reality, <laughs> the unreal bit, was the psychiatric ward that was telling me they were going to look for my son, and I just told them where he was. <sighs> I wrote about this 
under a pseudonym in, in the book that Irene um, mentioned that I'd edited, and I called this chapter Institutionalised Madness, because that's what it seemed to me, that the, the institution was not in touch with the world that I knew and that, that my son was in. Anyway, to cut a very, very long story short, they called me back after half an hour to say, well, the, um, the security staff are still searching the grounds and we'll get back to you soon. <laughs> and I said, well, he's, he's in the car with his dad. He just, he's just um, gonna, uh, come home and have a cup of tea and we'll talk about what to do. And they said, if you let him set foot inside your house, you will be contravening section blah, blah, blah of the Mental Health Act and we'll send the police out. Oh. So I just thought, yeah, we are dealing with mad people. <laughs> yeah. If he had been able to come home and have a cup of tea and we could have talked, we could have done things differently. I reckon it could all have been so different. But what I had to do, and this is the bit where I might cry because I get upset about it. I had to phone his dad, who was in the car with him, stopped, we're, we're, we're trying to decide which way to go, to come home or to go to hospital. And he had to say to my son, it comes back to what you said, Brenda, do you trust us? And he said, yeah. And, he's, and then his dad said, do you believe we will always do what is right for you? And he said, yeah, I know that. And from that day, for more or less 15 years without a break, he was detained under the Mental Health Act in many different institutions. Most of them didn't do anything to work with us as a family, to listen to us, or to listen to my son didn't appear. Each time he went somewhere new, they would say, when we've got the medication right, then we'll be able to do this or this or this. And each time I saw someone begin to unravel more and more and more, and get more and more angry more and more frustrated and in more and greater despair with no hope that he would ever have a life. And he became more and more angry with me because he could see that I had some power but what he couldn't see was I, I didn't have the power to change the Mental Health Act. And I couldn't convince for a long, long time other people that there could be other ways of doing things. And the number of times he would scream at me when I went to visit him. <coughs> Why did you let them do this to me? Why did you? Let them put me in prison, because that's what it felt like to him. And most of the time, I didn't have an answer. I tried to explain, but it was difficult. So there, you can see the bond, the love, the trust that was there over those years was broken. And we know that trust is so, so important. I was in despair 
a lot of the time. It had a huge impact on the whole of the family. And I know that this happens to so many families. It can split families apart because it can take over your life. You can't see a way forward. You try your best. And when you know that things aren't right, and you know that abuse is taking place, and you don't know how to stop it. And what I learned over the years was, sadly, the more I tried to negotiate and eventually led to uh, seeing advocacy services trying, uh, eventually being driven to having to make formal complaints. Sadly, things seemed to get worse, not better. Didn't improve anything. And I saw, and I can understand this, I could see the services. Defen defensive practice took over and I was seen as the difficult one. The one that didn't understand their ways of working. The one that was always complaining. And so I learned in the end not to complain that it didn't help. And I had to learn not to, I was actually advised by two people that I did respect. I was told, don't keep asking about the medication. He'll never get out if you keep going on about that. These are good people and they were right, they knew that. And I felt I had to zip my mouth and not ask why he was on such huge doses of medication. And that was so hard for me. But also, I learned that I had become so angry myself and so traumatised through all of this. And so had my family, my daughter. I felt that she had become, not estranged, but she didn't know how to be with me. And it caused family breakup in the end. I realised that I had to find for myself a different way of being. Not to be Mrs. Angry, not to be the mother that was never going to be satisfied. I had to find a different way of being with myself. And I had to find like more like-minded people. And this is why I ended up here on this stage. It was through organisations like ISPS, through finding out about Open Dialogue and becoming part of the Soteria Network and knowing that there were different ways of doing things. That it was possible to work with people in extreme states without using medication. And knowing that that was possible and trying to promote those way, ways of working was, became my salvation. It became part of my healing. And it was the way I learned to be better with myself. <clears throat> because I could see everything that had happened and the way I was so distressed and despondent with what had happened to Tom. That so I pushed people away. I pushed friends away. I pushed family members away. And I'd certainly pushed away anybody, many people working in the mental health system who could have helped me and could have been on my side. And it took me a long time to realize that the, the I don't know what you call it, the trauma that my son was going through had been, I'd been more than touched by it. I, at times I'd been taken over by it. And I was so overwhelmed by that trauma. So I couldn't live my own life. I couldn't do the things I knew would help me. And I had to find a new way of being.
So how am I here today? And not looking at my phone all the time to find out what's happened to my son. Has he absconded again? Has he been brought back by the police? All the things that were happening. And I think there were several tipping points there, as Brenda said, several tipping points. One was when I'd known about open dialogue for a long time, since the Madrid conference in 2005. And I went to a, a brilliant workshop, and some of the people in this room now may have been running that workshop. It's so long ago, I can't remember. But it was a four hour long workshop, and it was conducted like an open dialogue session. So the people that were doing it were in a circle and talking with each other and reflecting on their work and how it works, but in that dialogical way. And I can remember sitting there and thinking, well, this is so obvious. Why, why aren't we doing this? Why, why can't everybody work in this way? And I can remember looking around the outside of the circle, and many people seemed to be sitting there like this. And I guess I might be wrong, I might misread people, it seemed to be saying, well, this wouldn't work where I come from. Uh, and I guess it was probably because I didn't have what I see as their baggage about what they think does work. I was coming at it just from a sort of very human, straightforward perspective that being together and talking about things in an open way is a, is a respectful and compassionate way of working. I'm not saying it's the only way, but it's a, a, a good way of, of working from the start. And so I came back with all the info, and I thought, well, I just need to tell people back in the UK about open dialogue, and then we'll all do it. It didn't quite work that way, but I still, I still kept on. It was always there. And when open dialogue uh, became a possibility in the UK and when some trusts were trading on and trying to develop it I was asked to write an article from a family perspective about why I thought it was important and in this article I wrote about what I've, some of the things I've described to you not in detail but what I call the, the deep dark years and I didn't, how I didn't want other people to have to go through that and that's why I wanted to promote different ways of working, even though I knew it was too late for our family. And Val Jackson, who might be sitting here in this audience today, heard that and it, it really hit her hard. And she said, no, I don't believe it's ever too late for any family. There are always start from where people were at. And so we were able to do some form of open dialogue together with my son and myself. And we started off using drama therapy. And I think that made a big difference. Because if I'd said, oh, let's go and do some therapy, I think he'd have run down the road. Um, but I guess. For him, it felt like he had a lot of control, that he could play, he could mess about, he could do what he wanted to do, and he loved being on the stage. It had all started when he'd been playing the lead role in the school production of Oliver. Uh, and that happened to go in, and that when he had to go into a coffin, think about that, because he worked in The Undertakers for a scene, and that coincided with the day his dear Nana died. And that's a, a sad story, but drama ha had a role in his life. And I think he was through the drama therapy that started the open dialogue. He was able to, to work through some things that were important to him. But he, one day he might be standing here telling you a completely different story, and that's okay too. Um, but through open dialogue, 
I learned how to say difficult things and how to hear difficult things in a safe space. And it's so important to provide that safe space where you feel you can talk about it. difficult things, things that are overwhelming and have been stuck for a long time. And that really did make a difference. Um, and I believe that being able to do things like this, although it's hard for me to do, I do find that it can help me make sense of things through having to think about things and think about things over a long period of time. I also think it's really, really important that we have more space for family members <coughs> to be able to hear other people's stories like this and to be able to tell their own stories in a way where they're not being judged, they're not being blamed. Because I always believe that families are all doing their best. As Brenda said, it might not be the best thing for that person at that time. But we, can, uh, we always do what we believe to be the right thing at the time.